You know, last week, whenever uh, Angie was preaching her message, the Lord kind of just gave me three little, <laughs> three little ideas, and one of them, from what I remember, it said uh, it said light, and then I had Gideon in there because a specific thing having to do with Gideon and light, and then one other word that said light is in you, and so when I went back and looked at those. Because I knew that I had written something down whenever uh, she preached, and when I went back and looked at those three concepts, that's where the where this message was birthed out of last Sunday. But I titled my message "Let the Light Shine." So I guess I said all that to say, quite an interesting thing for me that this song right here, that I could feel the presence of God connected to it, and I know you felt what I felt when the night is holding on to me. God is holding on because oh. see in that song what he's trying to describe whoever wrote it is that the night is synonymous with darkness and that many times in our lives we feel darkness trying to cling to us. I don't know about you but I know that I've been there. Even whenever the cry of my heart deep down on the inside was, Lord, I want your light. I want your life. I want it to be magnified in my life. Still darkness refuses, it seems, to let go. Yeah. But I got good news for you this morning because God is light. Yes. And he has already prevailed over the darkness. Oh, yeah. Sometimes God has to bring us to a place where we're as convinced of that as what he is. Yes. So hold on, child of God. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, just be reminded that the God that you love and the God that you served is the God of light. And he is will make darkness let go of you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. So let the light shine. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray. And for the next however many minutes, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel, that I would be just a simple mouthpiece for you. Lord, I pray that you would move me out of the way so that you could use me and speak through me that your eternal word would go forth, that your people, your sheep, would be able to hear the word that you have to speak to them, oh Lord God. Lord, move Matt out of the way again and allow your word to go forth, Lord. But I pray that your word, I know your word is already anointed, but I pray that you would attach your anointing to the word, Lord God. The anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. The anointing, Lord God, that sets the captive free. Lord, no one else can do that but you, Holy Spirit. And you, you move through the word of God. And you change people's hearts and lives. And so I pray that you would do that for us here this morning, Lord. And for our loved ones that we're praying for. For those that might watch on video. We put it in your hands and we ask that you would have your way. In the story of Gideon, really I'm just going to do kind of like what I did last time I preached. And just going to use the story to, to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction. In the story of Gideon, this is one of the older books of the Old Testament. You have the first five books and then the book of Judges is next. So this is before Israel, this is after Israel's been wandering in a wilderness, after the parting of the Red Sea. It's after they've entered into the promised land, but it's before the time frame of the kings. And in these judges, during the time frame of the judges, what would happen is that the people of God would often rebel against God. Well, really and truly, it was a it was a it was a cycle that that persisted for over 400 years, where the people of God who had been liberated and given freedom to walk through the Red Sea out of Egypt, which is a type of the world, and brought into the Promised Land, which is a type of walking with God, yet at the same time would continue to move towards disobedience away from the presence of God, away from the will of God, and instead continue to move towards darkness. Now, you got to understand, God is so good in the way that he writes his word because we find ourselves, and I'm talking about every last one of us in this room this morning, doing much like the children of Israel, where we find ourselves many times moving in the direction that we're not supposed to move, but yet at the same time, God's response was, when his people were in pain, when his people cried out, he moved towards them and he would bring a judge, amen, to bring deliverance in the midst of that situation. In the book, of, in, the, in the writings regarding Gideon, he actually covers three chapters and spoken of about Gideon more than any other judge that's in the book of Judges. 
And the time frame where we are, if you would read it, I mean, we're not going to go there. It's in Judges 6, 7, and 8, but don't even put it on the screen because I'm just going to talk to you about it. During this time frame, the children of Israel, it starts off saying that the children of Israel were disobedient. And that God allowed the Midianites, which was the enemy of God's people, to prevail against them under the hand of the Midians. Meaning... The hand always describes strength and it, allow, it describes the fact that the enemy of Israel was allowed by God to be stronger in their lives than what God was in their life. God allowed it to be so because of their disobedience. Many times whenever we, and I preach this all the time, this isn't anything new because I've experienced it in my own life. When we open up the door through disobedience, we allow, we give permission to the enemy, God gives permission to the enemy because God is loving and he's kind and he's merciful and he's gracious and he loves us so much that he allows these things to happen so that he can turn our heart back towards him so that he can bring us to the place where we will realize that's not really what I want. What I really want is God. What I really want is the love, amen, and the light that he has come to bring. And so, What's interesting to me is that he allowed this for seven years. Now, you know, the number seven is very instrumental in the, in the work of God because, see, it was on the seventh day that God rested from his work. What the number seven describes is a time of completion, a time of fulfillment. God allowed his own children to come under the hand of the enemy for a time and a purpose that his will would be fulfilled in their lives. And the reason that he showed up and he spoke to Gideon was because he heard the cry of his people. The Bible says that his people were afflicted and in their affliction they cried out to God. And when they cried out to God, he moved. Yeah. He moved on their behalf. He showed up in the midst of that situation and circumstance. You know, God will use various forms of judgment in order to bring correction into our lives. He'll affect, if he has to, every aspect of our lives. The Bible explains in the book of Judges that the way that God allowed the Midianites to afflict Israel was that every year when it was harvest time, now I want you to imagine this, every year when it was harvest time, what would happen is the Midianites would show up with all their cattle and all their camels. The Bible says that there were more camels than you can imagine the sand on the seashore. I know that there's some hyperbole there, but the point that the Bible wants us to realize is that there were more animals than it just stretched beyond what the eye could see. Now you got to imagine the result of that. The result of that is that all that cattle, all those camels, all those people would eat up all the grass, all the foliage was, was, was destroyed. Therefore, Israel didn't have any grass for their own animals. And, and then they would steal Israel's harvest. So every year, whenever Israel would harvest, here comes the Midianites, steals their crop, steals their prosperity, and their animals just eat everything up. And I just imagine in my mind, as the Midianites leave after the harvest season, the hills of Judea are just brown. Because everything is dead and there's just been a waste and a famine strikes the land and God's people are without. And I got to tell you that it's never God's will that his people would be without. But he always wants to be there to be able to provide and to be able to sustain us and to give us strength. They would steal the harvest of Israel, the prosperity for away from God. The land was barren and the enemy would leave. And the grass, it would start to grow again. And then when it was time to sow seed, the Israelite people would go out and they would begin to sow seed again. And then just like clockwork, <coughs> here it goes again. Another year, the Midianites show up with all the cattle and all the camels, steal the harvest, ravage the land. And year after year, for seven years, the cycle would not be broken. But when the time is right, he approaches them and he makes a way. 
right there when you least expect it or when it looks so bad that you don't see any way out and you're hiding from God, hiding from your enemies, hiding from anything because you don't want to deal with any of it. He will show up and he will offer a way. I got to tell you that God's going to show up and he's going to offer a way. And that prayer that Ross was praying with me yesterday, whenever he reminded me, no, Jesus showed up to the man of Gadarene. The man of Gadarene could not get out of where he was. He could not loose himself to get to Jesus, but Jesus showed up to where he was. Oh, yes. The woman of Samaria didn't even know where to go. The Bible said that she had had five, five husbands before and that the man she was with now wasn't even her husband and she had exhausted all of her resources. She didn't know which way to turn. She didn't know what she really needed because she was bound up in false religion. But the Bible says Jesus went to Samaria and there he found her. I thank God that Jesus came and he found me. Because if truth be told... I didn't just wake up one morning and go running after Jesus. I know sometimes whenever we're doing good with the Lord or we think we're doing good with the Lord, we get this high and mighty spiritual kind. Con- Man, I'm a God chaser. I went running after God. You ain't run, know how to run after God till God showed up in the middle of your darkness and touched your heart and revealed himself to you. God in his mercy and his grace and his uh, kindness reached out to you. Amen. He found Gideon, God did, threshing wheat in a wine press. You know, I've, I've actually preached some of these concepts before, but you know, when you, when you thresh wheat, what does that mean? It means that they would, there's a big old process, but they take the wheat, because you got to get the husk off of the little, the grains of wheat back in the day. They, don't, they didn't have factories back then. And they lay it out on this big, they'd find a big old rock that was flat or maybe multiple rocks and they'd lay all that wheat down there and then they'd drag like a millstone on top of it to separate the husk and then they'd get almost like a pitchfork and they'd start throwing it up in the air and the threshing floor was supposed to be out in an open area where the wind could carry the chaff off and the heavier weight would fall back to the ground. There's a lot of spiritual implications in that but that's not what we're preaching this morning. But what I want you to know is this, is that that Gideon was instead inside of a wine press. But you're not, but, so there's no wind blowing, really. That's not where you're supposed to thresh wheat. But that's where he was. And the Bible says that he was in there because for fear of the enemy, that the enemy was going to steal his harvest, Gideon was trying to hold on to the little bit that he had left. And God showed up in the middle of that situation through an angel and revealed his will for Gideon's life. In order for victory to come, once God speaks, the people of God are going to have to make a move in the right direction. And I got to tell you that the first thing that Gideon did was he tore down the idols of Baal and another false god named Ashtoreth. He tore them down and he burnt them. Now listen to me, idols in the Old Testament were more like statues, things that you could physically see. Sometimes idols in the life of New Testament Christian are things you can see, but sometimes they're just things, mindsets, Amen. things that have our heart. What is it that has your heart this morning? I know that what we want to have our heart is Jesus because we wouldn't even be in the church this morning if we didn't want Jesus to have our heart. But what I'm asking you to do, what I need the preacher to do, what we all need to do, anybody watching on video, we need to ask ourselves, what has our heart this morning? Is it God that truly has our heart or is our heart connected to something else? Yes. Could it be another person? Could it be, could it be a mindset of, you know, whatever things that we want and we're so focused and, and bent on getting what it is that our heart desires that that thing is standing between us and God. Anything that is in our heart that stands between us and God and prevents us from moving towards God, from moving towards His light, is an idol in our life. And before we're ever going to be able to move closer to God, we're going to have to realize that those idols have to come down. That's what Gideon did. He chopped down the idol to Baal. He chopped down the Asherah pole. And he burnt them and he destroyed them. And then what he did was he built an altar to God. And he offered up a sacrifice. And that's a type of the cross. Because you see, the altar was where the animal was killed. The cross was where the Lamb of God died so that he could get, give forgiveness to you and I so that we could come back to God and have a relationship with him. God 
made a move and oh, I'm sorry, Gideon made a move and obeyed God. He burned those idols. He built an altar. And again, two things have to happen. There has to be a movement away from the wrong and there has to be a movement towards what is right. Mm -hmm. This describes repentance. The simple definition of repentance is to change one's mind. When you take the idea of repentance to change one's mind and the idea of confession, which means to say the same thing, basically what we're doing when we truly repent is that our mind is lining up with the mind of God and saying, I was wrong, you're right, and now, God, I want to go your way because my way was bringing destruction. No man can make you get there. No preacher can say it enough times to get you there. Amen. It has to be the word of God. It has to be the anointing of God. God has to do, has to deliberately do a work on the inside of our mind to where we will begin to think the way that he thinks and we must surrender to his ways and to his will. We must surrender to the mind of God that he has communicated to us through his word. When a person like Gideon builds an altar and brings a sacrifice to God, again, that's like you and I going to the cross and realizing we were wrong and realizing that Jesus' sacrifice is the only thing that can get us in to the presence of God where healing takes place. Amen. Well, what, what do you mean, preacher? Without Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, without the cross, the sacrifice of God, then you and I are still guilty in our sin and we can't get to God, but it will come through the cross, then our sin has been atoned, our sin has been dealt with on, in Christ, amen, and now we can have access into the presence of God. Amen. You know the way that God ended up giving the victory was that he made Gideon separate out a small army of men. It was only 300 men. Compared to the vast army of the Midianites, that was just a handful of men. You know the reason that God did it this way? He says it in the story. If you go back and you read it, he said, because if I don't do it this way, Israel will vaunteth itself. What does that mean? Vaunteth itself. Israel is going to become prideful. Israel's going to poke out her chest and she's going to lift up her nose a little bit and she's going to say, look what I have done. Mm -hmm. Look what I have accomplished with, my, with this army that we have. Yeah, they might throw a little bit of God up in there, but the reality of it is, is that they're going to be looking more at what they accomplished rather than what God accomplished. But if God will whittle a big old army all the way down to just 300 and through that 300 give a victory in the enemy's camp, then everybody's going to know who really deserves the glory. Everybody's going to know who's really the God and everybody's going to know who's really the man. Amen. God will not share his glory with another. If our mindsets are wrong and we're getting puffed up and full of pride, I'm telling you, God knows how to bring us down a couple of notches. <laughs> There is a constant reminder from the heart of God to ours that he really doesn't need our help. That's something that God has been showing me a lot lately. Because, you know, many times as Christians, we think that we need to help the Lord. You know? Oh, if I'll make this little move right here, then I can help the Lord to really bring this person to their knees. Or, you know, whatever. No, no, no. God doesn't need our help. What God want, is asking us to do is to pray, and especially like if we're praying for someone else, to pray that his will for that person's life will be done. Yes. Because God, listen to me, you can't trust your own motives of your own heart. Right. Do you believe that when I tell you that? Am I trying to say that you're some horrible person? Listen, I'm trying to tell you what the Word of God says. The, the book of Jeremiah says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked who can know it? What that means is, is that even sometimes at our best, our motives are wrong. Anybody in this place, you got to know what I'm talking about. When someone has done you wrong, yeah. amen, and you're over there praying for them, but yet many times your prayer includes maybe a wrong motive where you kind of want to see something happen. Come on, Lord, exact your judgment on that yeah. person. You know, God doesn't need you and I to tell him when to exact judgment. God knows when he's going to bring judgment. God knows when he's going to bring chastisement. God knows when he's going to bring, bring grace and mercy. And he's the one that pours it out in the right measure at the right time to get the right effect that he desires to see Amen. in the life. 
Constant reminder from the heart of God. He doesn't really need our help. As a matter of fact, when we try to help, we only get in the way. God wants us to trust him with his plan and for us to move out of the way and let him work so that he can reveal his power and his glory. And so once God got the army down to 300 and he knew that not Gideon nor anyone else other than him would get the glory, he told them to put some torches inside of some clay pots. And on the signal of the shout and the blowing of the trumpet, he instructed them to break the clay vessels, which then would allow the light from the torches to shine through. And so there they were up on a hill and the enemy was down in the camp. And they came in there with their torches hidden inside of these clay vessels. These 300 men, and they had these trumpets. And with the shout of the war cry and the blowing of the war trumpet, they broke the vessels and then the hillside illuminated and the word of God says that all of a sudden the enemy was in the midst of confusion and he began to turn his weapons on himself the God that we serve can do incredible miraculous things that are beyond our imagination just when we think that we have no hope just when we think that we're bound up just when we over here and we're threshing weed inside a wine press because we're scared and we're fearful and we're trying to hold on to the little bit that we have left God will show up and he'll do a suddenly he'll do a miracle on our behalf and he'll begin to bring freedom in our lives thank you Lord let the light shine. Amen. Amen. One of the first things that I want to talk to you about is that his light will show you where to go. Can you put Psalm 119 starting with 103 up there? His light will show you where to go. We see this kind of concept throughout the word of God where like a compass, you're, you and I are like a man or a woman on a journey. Amen. Amen. You're on a journey and you're walking upon this earth and the word of God is like a compass that's lead, that should lead you and direct you in the way that you should go. Now, I don't, I don't mean to get off on too big of a rabbit trail, but let me just say this. We're either getting our direction from the word of God, from the spirit of God, and the spirit of God will never contradict the word of God, and the word of God will never contradict the spirit of God. We're either getting our bearings for our compass and the direction we're to go from the word of God, or... We're getting it from an outside source. Amen. What I'm trying to say is, is that the world is vying for your attention. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that even your friends that are near you on the outside looking in are trying to get your attention. What I'm trying to say is that the world's saying, hey, if you got pain, hey, if you got sorrow, hey, if you got anxiety, this is what we have to offer you. And we reach out to those things and they do nothing but leave us empty. They leave us empty and they leave us sorrowful and they, allow, and they cause us to go further into a spiral away from the will of God, away from the ways of God. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's word wants to get, show you the direction that you should go. This is what the psalmist said. He said, how sweet are your words unto my taste. Now I got to tell you something, child of God. This has been really prevalent again in my mind lately. I said it the last time I preached and I'm going to say it again. When you open up this book and you begin to read, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm trying to explain something to you. So I don't want you, don't, don't get hurt, don't get frustrated. But if you open up this book and you start reading it and you feel a frustration, if you feel animosity, like, you have a desire to close this book because it's not doing anything for you. I'm here to tell you that is an attack from the enemy over your life. That is an attack from the enemy over your life because the enemy knows, oh no, she found the map. He found the compass. Oh no, he's going to know it. He's, he's looking to the light. I, I got I to gotta get him to close that book. I got to get her to, to put it back on the shelf because I cannot afford to have her or him to find the direction that God wants them to go. Amen. If you're in the song service and you feel this song service is a little too long. If you're in the prayer group and you feel, oh my gosh, I just wish that they'd quit praying. 
If the people are singing good stuff and the people are praying good stuff and, and the word of God coming out is the right word of God, then guess what? That's an attack from the enemy on your life. Yeah, right. Why did I even say that? Because David said, how sweet are your words unto my taste? Yes, they're sweeter than honey to my mouth. Lord, won't you bring us to a place where we'll feel that way? Won't you bring us to a place where your word becomes like honey to our mouth? Through your precepts, through the law of God, which is, was Israel's word, amen? Through the word of God, I get understanding. When I open up the word of God, and then I, get, I gain the understanding of God. I'm able to think more like him instead of think like the world around me. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I don't even think that we could preach on that long enough. I hate every false way. Amen. Amen. What are the false ways that the enemy is putting in your path to try to draw you away? I don't have to spell them all out. I don't have to fill in the blank for you. The Holy Spirit right now, he'll show you. He'll show you right now every false way where the enemy brings it into your heart and in your life to try to get you away. But look at what 105 says. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Yes. It's a light unto my path. The word of God will illuminate your feet closely so that you can see the next step you're going to take. But not only that, it'll illuminate the path. He'll show you the direction where you are to go. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, darkness covered the face of the deep. When we think of the creation story, you can't see where you're going in the middle of darkness. The first thing God said in creation was let there be light because without light, there is no direction. Without light, there is no life, right? There's no grass. There's no trees. There's no animal life. Without light, there can be no life. God made light. God is light. And in order for man to know where to go and what to do, he must at all costs have the light of God working in his life. He must at all costs take notice of the word of God. He must read it. He must study it. He must move towards the light. And if he will move towards the light, if he will walk in the light, he will be moving towards God. Hallelujah. Lord, give us a hunger for your word. Lord, allow your word to be like honey on our lips. Lord, allow your word. Let us fall in love with it. Let us realize that it's truly your understanding that you have left for us, that we might know you, that we might have a compass and direction for our lives, that we might know which way to walk. Lord, give us revelation of your word. Yes. That it wouldn't just be empty words on a page, that we're going through some monotonous mood. No, no, no. Lord, Cause us to become hungry. Let your word be like the manna that fell from heaven and fed the children of Israel. Let it bring sustenance to us. Let it nourish our spirit, man. Give us a revelation of your son and what he did for us that we could walk with you. That's the first thing I wanted you to know. I wanted you to know that his light will show you where to go. The second thing I want you to know is this. I want you to know that God is light. Amen. Amen. I'm going to look at two different scripture, two different passages of scripture because I want, I want to compare them with you. Look at John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. It says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness really a, a better translation would be the darkness apprehends it not meaning the darkness could not overcome it meaning the darkness could not seize it and take control over it. I got good news for you this morning, child of God. You might feel like you're in the middle of darkness, but I'm here to tell you that darkness does not prevail against the light of God. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, again, just like the, the passage we just read in John, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The condition of the earth 
form and void just prior to the creation of light describes an empty place. I need you to know that. Those two words, without form and void, this is what it describes. <coughs> it describes an empty place of chaos, a place that is hostile to life. And the first thing God does is that he creates light and he separates light from darkness. I don't think that I can really use words that would explain properly what I'm trying to say. Darkness was over the face of the deep. But the idea here, and I don't want to get too deep, is that something's not right. Mm. Really, many people believe that God had already created and that the enemy of God had caused a fall of the angelic creation. And now the earth that was already there was without form and void and darkness because that's what those two words mean. It means chaos, hostility. It means emptiness. See, just as the earth physically found itself in the midst of darkness and in chaos and without form and void, so our lives in our first birth with Adam find itself enveloped in darkness, find our old man empty, our life chaotic, full of confusion. When these two Scriptures are read one after the other. The connection of God's light dividing and separating light from darkness should jump off the page. And the way that physical light pushed away physical darkness is the same way that spiritual light in Christ pushes away the, se the darkness of sin. Where there is a lack of light, there is a preponderance of darkness and also the opposite. When there is a flood of light, darkness is dispelled. Your heart, my heart. And Adam was like the earth, but Jesus brought his light. And when we accept that light, it begins to push away the darkness in our life. Amen. Again, I want you to know that God is light. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 7. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this particular scripture here because I really feel like the Lord was speaking to me in it. He says, this then is the message which we have heard of him. Talking about God. This is what John says. We heard this message from God. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And we don't do the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The message of God is clear. God is light. The message of God is clear. There's not even one little bit of darkness in him. If we're walking towards God, we're walking away from darkness. To walk. What does that mean? It, it describes the progress that we make. Right? We're, we're, progress we're moving from point A to point B. So surely the walk can describe the journey. But what else does it mean? The way you live. The way you regulate your life, the way you conduct your behavior. Sometimes I just feel like, you know, I, I, sometimes I want to get like real, you know, and just kind of explain it. I can just remember back whenever I was in really like live, walking in darkness, like ordering my steps after the ways of darkness. Yeah, I mean, for me, I had a big problem with drugs and alcohol and everything else that that brings with it. But my behavior, not even just talking about the stuff that I was putting in me, but the stuff that was coming out of me. So much chaos, so much confusion, so much yelling and screaming and arguing and bickering and fighting and lack of peace and just a big old mess yeah. is what I was trying. How do, you, how do we regulate our life? How do we conduct our behavior? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be full of uneasiness and lacking peace. And instead, my spirit full of turmoil and chaos and confusion. Amen. I want the will of God working in my life. I want to be walking in the light. I want to be ordering my steps after the light of God. Amen. He said this. He said, if we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, we lie. You know the word fellowship? I talk to y'all a lot about this Greek word. You might remember, you might not, koinonia. Many times it's translated as communion. 
It can be translated as communion. It can be translated as fellowship. But you know what it means? It, it describes a close association. The word communion is a compound word and it means a common union. So you're connected to something else. You're, you're yoked up with something else. It means a joint participation. So just as you can have fellowship with God and fellowship with the Holy Spirit by understanding His Word and through His grace being strengthened to move in the right direction, you can also have fellowship with darkness. You can also have a common union with darkness. You can also conduct your life according to darkness. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, when I find myself in the midst of a group of people that are doing things that are completely contrary to the word of God, now I'm joint participating with darkness. When I find myself in the midst of a group of people that are doing things that are contrary to the word of God, I'm associating myself with them. And whatever is bringing us together is our common union. Whereas whenever you and I are following after the light of God, now we're associating, we should be associating with the people of God. We should be associating with the things of God, amen, with the word of God. We should be participating with the Holy Spirit as he's leading us and guiding us in truth. If God is light and there is no darkness in him at all, and we, on the other hand, are walking in darkness, what does that mean? What does it mean to walk in darkness? It means that we are living our lives in a way where we are, one, fellowshipping with darkness. If we're fellowshipping with darkness, we aren't fellowshipping with God. Amen. If we are in communion with darkness, then we're not in communion with God. If we joint participate with darkness, then we aren't joint participating with God. Why? Because in him, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You can't do the same thing at the same time, child of God. You can't fellowship and be in communion with darkness and at the same time say that you're in fellowship and communion with God. What this is describing is a lifestyle. This is describing I wake up and I throw my feet on the side of the bed and I walk in darkness away from God rather than walking with God towards the light. I'm ordering my steps according to darkness. The decisions that I'm making are contrary to the word of God. The decisions that I'm making are pulling me away from God instead of pulling me towards God. If we say we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, we lie. And the truth is not in us. Lord, help us. That we not be liars. Lord, help us to walk according to your will in your light to walk in the direction where you would bring us. Amen. 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 For ordering our lives daily in darkness and at the same time say we're walking with God. The truth of God is not in us. And that happens though, doesn't it? That does happen a lot of times in our lives. I don't mean to get ahead of myself where... We, we still think we're okay. Mm -hmm. The next thing I want you to know is that God wants to shine his light through you. Amen. Mm -hmm. God has a purpose for you. I got to tell you that. His purpose for you on this earth is not that you'd be a millionaire. Yeah. Some of you in here, you might be a millionaire one day. But that wasn't his purpose that he ordained for your life. That's just a blessing that he allowed you to have. If, if indeed it is a blessing and not a curse. God's purpose for your life was not that you'd be a millionaire, was not that you'd be the best nurse practitioner, was not that you'd be the best hairdresser, was not that you'd be the best whatever, 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 the best athlete. That wasn't God's purpose for your life. God's purpose for your life was that you would bow your knee to him, give your heart to Jesus, and that the light of God would shine through you that others might be able to see the glory of God. That's his purpose for your life. He wants to shine his light through you. The danger of walking in sin is that the darkness slowly fades spiritual vision. A decline away from God is often a slow move away from God. Making it difficult to perceive how far away we are. As we walk away from light, we slowly become acclimated or used to darkness. You understand? 
Because it's a slow fade. There was an old song. I can't remember. Casting crowns maybe. It's a slow fade when you give your life away. Where black and white turn to gray. We enter into this, this middle road. Where we think that we're okay. We still feel like we're walking in the light. And that we're walking with God. But in reality we've started to fellowship with darkness. Just listen to me. How many times do you talk to people out there in the world. And like oh yeah I'm a Christian. All of Facebook world is a Christian. Oh we're just such believers. Listen to me. <clears throat> I don't know. And if you. I doubt seriously that you would remember. You might have. But you smart guy. I went and got my hair cut yesterday. And there was a dude on the couch across from me. And, and he was getting ready to get his hair cut. And I'm going to be honest with you. I thought it was a setup for me. Because I had sat in my car and I was reading and prepare, you know, preparing for my message, waiting on the haircut. But when I went back in there, all of a sudden, <laughs> this dude, and I mean, he just didn't, I don't, don't want to be judgmental about the way he looked. But anyway, I just, when I first looked at him, what are Christians supposed to look like? Well, let, let me not even go there. But immediately... He starts messing with his phone and he starts listening. And I can hear this guy quoting scripture. And then all of a sudden, the dude that's listening to the phone starts using all this language. Okay. So I'm thinking to myself, while I was in my car, these two hairdressers had a conversation about, because I walked in and I signed my name and then I walked back out. I'm thinking these two hairdressers had a conversation and, they were maybe talking about the fact that sometimes I'll talk about the Lord. And so this dude is completely against God. And he puts this phone on and he's listening to this preaching. And he uses some really hard, I would call expletives. I haven't used, by the grace of God, words like that in quite a while. And I just didn't associate Christianity with, I mean, look, it's one thing if you, if you say the, a, a bad cuss word. Okay, things happen. I'm not telling you that we should live our life that way because it's not God's will. God wants to clean our mouth up. He wants us to speak forth encouraging words. He wants us to speak forth words that will lift people up and empower them. He doesn't want us using language that's going to cut them to pieces and shred them up and tear them down. That's not God's will. So I just didn't associate the words that were coming out of his mouth that he was calling this preacher. And I don't even know what the preacher was preaching. He might have been preaching false doctrine. But, that, but what I got was going on was that this dude was like kind of calling me out. Well, come to find out that wasn't what it was at all. The dude starts talking about being born again, about being a Goliath slayer, about being like David and being a warrior for the Lord and all of this other kind of stuff like that. And I was like, wow. So I just kind of like, you know, at some point in time, I just started kind of talking to him and whatever the case. I think the point that I'm trying to make is I'm going back to the song where it said it's a slow thing. When you give yourself away. Where black and white turn to gray. I mean for him to know the things that he knew. He talked about the Anakin. Which is the sons of Anak. Which talks about the Nephilim. And he knows all this kind of stuff. I mean most people in the body of Christ. Don't even know about any of that. So for him to have studied as much as he did. Yet at the same time. This is his conversation. This is how he speaks. This is, And it was just a very strange thing for me. But I need you to know. As we're moving away, sometimes we're moving away from God and we're moving away from the light and towards sin. And we're not even realizing how far away we've gone. And when we go back to the last scripture we talked about, it says this. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk perpetually live our life according to darkness, then the truth is not in us and we're lying. Lord, help us to be able to see that. The only reason I'm preaching it is because I want to be able to see it. The only reason I would tell you is because I want you and myself to be able to see that. That we can't walk in darkness and at the same time say that we have fellowship with God because God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Amen. So Lord, hear the cry of our heart. We, we're definitely not where we really need to be. Thank God, hopefully we're not where we used to be. But Lord, bring us forward and help us move towards the light. Amen? Amen. Help us move towards the light. Help us move towards you. You know, one of the first moves away from God and light towards sin and darkness is fellowship with unbelievers. Again, that fellowship describes an association. It describes a bond. It describes the fact that there's a closeness. Yeah. So we're supposed to be having fellowship with God, fellowship with people of common, uh, of, of like-mindedness. Yeah. 
I'm not trying to say you'll never have a worldly acquaintance, but you ain't supposed to be right. hugging up on the world, my friend. Amen. You're not supposed to be cozying up with the world. Amen. And that's why, you know, people get tired of hearing me say that kind of stuff. And I've said it before, you know, um, I can't even really remember, you know, some of these people's songs. It's not important, but that's why I always come against secular music. And people I know a lot of times are like, oh, man, he's. I'm not going back to that church. He's talking about my music. He's talking, hey, you think I didn't used to listen to, to, to worldly music? And you think that that stuff didn't have a, a stronghold on me? And that I kept wanting to gravitate towards it? But that's a classic example of describing to you a type of fellowship with the world. Well, what are you talking about? You're in your vehicle, you have worldly music on, and you're over here in agreement with what the world's preaching to your spirit. Come on, somebody. Oh, well, I just listen to country music. I don't listen. No, no, no. I don't think I'll sit down on this pier right here and have myself a beer because my old lady left me and life stinks and I'm miserable. So let me just numb the pain a little bit. That's a world that you're fellowshipping with the world. The world's speaking to you and telling you that this is the way that you should get over this. And the whole time the light of God and the word of God is saying, hey, I'm illuminating your feet. I'm going to light up your path. I'm going to show you a new way to go. Walk towards me in the light and you'll leave the darkness behind. God doesn't want you and I walking in darkness and meddling around with the world Amen. fellowshipping with the world that darkness will slowly bring us to a gray place and we will be confused and we will think that we're okay yes. Yes. don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers you can't keep going to the same old place of darkness and expecting new or different results. You can't keep going back and hanging out with people that are in the midst of darkness that have all the stuff that you keep falling prey to. And like a carrot in front of a horse's nose, just being led to the slaughter and, and, and uh, your life and your spiritual walk being destroyed. You can't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We can't cozy up to the world and give it a hug and say to it, you are beautiful. Will you be my friend and expect that there won't be a spiritual decline in our lives? Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Yvette, would you come up here and get your guitar? And I'm just going to ask you to play a song whenever I close. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, it says this. You are the light of the world. See, the scripture that we read the point number two was that God was light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The scripture that, that, that in God is light, we also learn that Jesus was the life sent from God and that his life was the light of men. Just as the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep, the fall of man caused darkness within the entirety of the human race. But Jesus, the light from God, came to the earth. And when we receive that light, it enters in on the inside of us. That light from Jesus comes to live on the inside of us. The Word of God says in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. If you're saved this morning, you are the light of the world. Brennan, you're the light of the world. Manuel, you're the light of the world. Brothers and sisters, you're the the light of the world, if indeed you are saved this morning. Oh, but preacher, you don't know what I did yet. That's not what I said. I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about what you did yesterday or last night or last week. We, we ain't talking about what I did. But what I am here to talk to you about is this, is that if you are saved, and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, then the light of God is resident on the inside of you. Oh, you might have tried to suppress it. You might have been walking away from it and it got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. But I'm telling you right now, if you're saved and the light of God's in you, if you'll start moving towards the light, guess what's going to happen? It's going to start shining again. Just like, see, just like that clay vessel had to be broken in the story of Gideon for the light to come through. You know, you and I were formed out of clay. Did you know that? That's what the Word of God says. God reached down there and He grabbed a handful of clay and He molded it and He breathed His life into Adam and He created you and I out of clay. And whenever our clay is broken in the light and moved out of the way, then the light of God can shine. So don't despise the breaking of the Lord. Don't despise the chastisement of the Lord when it brings correction into your life. Instead, embrace Him and say, Yes, Lord, I want your way. A city that is on a hill cannot be hidden.
God wants his light to shine through you because there's people that need to know him. I know I've said it many times in the past, but the Judean hillside was very rocky and there would be valleys. And a city that was set up on a hill can't be hidden. What that means is, is that those, those people that were journeying at night could see the city up on the hill because it was lit up. They had torches or whatever they would do. And it's like they knew, there it is. There's the city I'm looking for. It's, it's straight ahead. I might be surrounded by darkness, but I see the light up ahead. Listen, there's a world full of people that are surrounded by darkness. But the light of God wants to shine out of you so that they can see, so that they can be led into the right direction. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. God has given us his light because his plan for this world is that light will dispel darkness. He allows us to fellowship with his light so that others can see and know which way to go. But for our own good, let's not even talk about for the good of others right now. For our own good, won't we move away from darkness? Won't we move away from darkness and move towards his wonderful light? Yvette's going to play a song and we're going to worship the Lord. If you need prayer or you want me to pray with you, the altars are open. Amen. If not, we're just going to worship the Lord together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.